Good morning. Good morning. It's good to have you here today. Good to see you all. And, uh, we're excited about uh, this morning and uh, the message for you, as we always are. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's uh, get into some singing, worship the Lord together. Let's sing number six. Number six. I sing the mighty power of God. Let's stand together as we sing.
is that he was so brutally honest with himself <coughs> that it was truth in the inward part and thus knowing wisdom. See, elsewhere in Proverbs, we're told on, on what, eight different times that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, an awesome understanding or respect for who God is is the beginning of us understanding our true place. Now, by the way, I don't want us walking around and always guilty and always struggling in our sin and always overwhelmed by our failures. That's not the purpose of this. But when dealing with the sin, if we want our heart regenerated, we've got to be honest. We've got to tell God not, hey, I've been a pretty good person and I deserve for you to, to clean this up in my life because I've been a pretty good person. Instead, we need to say exactly what David says here. And it's something that I think should encourage your heart. Because it means that it's not on my deserving. Because the honest truth is, is once we start to focus so much on not deserving, sometimes we uh, allow guilt to fester within us. And that's not it either. What God really wants out of me is exactly David's words. Let's look at verse 1 for our first point. We can only call on God's mercy. In verse number one, he says, have mercy upon me. That's how he starts out this prayer, this, this call to God. Have mercy upon me, O God. I submit to you that that is where we need to begin with our desire to have our relationship with God restored. Not on the idea that I'm a Christian and I've done all these things and I serve in these different ways and I've been faithful, but have mercy. That's all I can put out there. I need your mercy. He says, in, in taking that even further, we can only call on God's mercy as our first point, and he must help is the idea underneath of that, if you're looking at your outline on the back there. According to thy loving kindness, it says. According to thy loving kindness. Now, what does it mean to have God's loving kindness? That means for him to give us something that we don't deserve, but is based on his love and kindness towards us. It's a special relationship and caring about us. Listen, that's not based on me. That's all based on him. It's all him. David, a man after God's own heart, cannot say he's a man after God's own heart because David was so perfect. He wasn't. David gets to call himself a man after God's own heart because in his relationship with God, God was perfect. By the way, God's desire with every single one of us is to be exactly that. Loving kindness. Fix the mess. Take care of it. But true fixing does not happen with cover-up or, or internal lying to ourselves about the severity of the issue. By the way, I am not advocating today that everybody pour out all their sins and tell everybody here, this is between you and God. There are times to do that, but this is between you and God. Okay? It's an honest, open heart with God where you say, oh Lord, I call on your mercy. I have no power within myself. According to your loving kindness, your special relationship with me that extends to me a, a special kind of family love and kindness that I don't deserve. Look, look at the next part. It says, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Don't you love that word tender there? Tender mercies. I see God as such a kind, soft individual who has the power to squash. But his desire is to be loving kindness and tender mercy. Yes, I, I deserve for my sin to be squashed by God. And I should never forget that he's the one that's extending loving kindness and tender mercy. To be tender with something is just a, a special 
way of treating me. You know, we're calling on His mercy, but we're asking God to have a relationship mercy. Not just extending it out and saying, here, take this. But it's a true relationship with God. Each of these two points are true relationship with God. But they come from us recognizing this is not because of me. This is not me getting things right. David understood he was the failure, not God. And God needs to be called on because God is the only help you can have. It's not according to anything that we have done. It's according to His mercy, His grace that He saved us. That's the way we need to see things. And that starts at salvation. But folks, even after we're saved, and we can't lose our salvation, we, we are guaranteed that for life, sealed until the day of judgment by the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' hand and held in God's hand as well. And, and all that God has given to Jesus, He shall lose none. We cannot lose our salvation. We're not talking about that. We're talking about, though, as a failure, as a believer, just like David. And we all have them. Thoughts you think, things you say, what you might watch. All of these things that we struggle with, honesty is the beginning. God, I can't beat this addiction. I can't do this on my own. I can't just show up at AA or other places and achieve victory from this. I need, I must have you. Your tender mercies. Your loving kindness. You know, there are some people who go around telling Christians that once they get saved, all these things should fall away. <laughs> I don't see where that's in the Bible. <clears throat> in fact, I, I think that God is still working on all of us to, to work those things out. One of the greatest men throughout Scripture, I think, people who truly understood his failure and thus worked accordingly, the Apostle Paul said, I fail every day. The things that I want to do, I shouldn't do. And the things I'm supposed to do, I don't do. That's what the Apostle Paul said, to Andrew's paraphrase. <coughs> okay? Because the, the picture for us needs to be that this is a constant struggle in life. But the best way to beat it is to know that when I wake up in the morning, I need to be pleading for God's tender mercies and His loving kindness today. And then after I sin, I need to go right to Him. Not hide from Him, but realize that He is tender in His mercy. And He is loving in His kindness. And He wants to have this relationship with me. And so when I hide my sin, which isn't really hidden from Him, I'm not helping myself. What I really need to do is I need to recognize He must help Without his help, I have nothing. So I turn it over to, according to his loving kindness, and according to his tender mercies. And then the second part is, he must clean. Look at the end of verse 1. He must clean. So it's not even that he must help. It's not that he helps me and then I, you know, get in the tub and I wash myself. That's not it. Look at the end of verse 1. It says, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. We didn't even look at multitude there, but... Uh, blot out my transgressions. I don't know about you folks, but I'm a messy eater. And unfortunately, I have enjoyed eating to the place to where I have a shelf upon which I can rest things. <laughs> and so that shelf tends to catch food when I drop it. And, and no matter how careful I am, I tend to drop it on a regular basis. And so I end up with stains on things that I can't get out. My wife tries to help me by carrying this, this tied to go pen. <laughs> and as soon as I, I make a mistake, she tries to blot it out for me. To put something on it that will help it to go away. <coughs> 
God's blotting works a whole lot better than that, by the way. All right? But I, I want us to think that that's exactly who God is. And by the way, I'm not trying to tell you that God can blot something out years down the road that you've been carrying and buried for, for years in your own heart, trying to hide, whatever. But listen, what's the best way to treat a state? The sooner the better. The faster you get to it, the more clear it is washed free. Folks, I think we should understand that the feelers that, that come within us and reach into other areas of our lives are allowed to grow and fester there because we don't deal directly with God and fix it. We don't tell them, I failed, and I'm miserable at this, I need you. And I can only call on your mercy in that loving kindness and in that tender mercy would you blot out my failure before it ruins the whole thing. But look at the next part. Verse 2 gives us two more sides to he must clean. It says, wash me throughly from mine iniquity. Wash me throughly. Look at the words there. How's it spelled? T-H-R-O-U. Truly. Yours has a different one? Thoroughly. Mine has truly. T H R O U G H L Y. Truly. Now listen, thoroughly is a good enough answer. I'm not saying it's bad. You want to be washed thoroughly. But listen, truly is the idea of totally through me all the way. In other words, no hidden deep stains that are left in there. Nothing that causes me to have a problem down the road. Truly, entirely, get into every part of the fabric. Get there. And fix it. Now, again, am I capable of going into my own heart and washing every nook and cranny of where God is, 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 you know, can see that sin and its effects on me? No. So who must do it? Him. Him. I'm like a child trying to give himself a bath. I don't know about y'all, but I had a grandmother. She was German. And I believe that she thought the greatest idea in the world was to scrub you till there weren't no skin no more. <laughs> She'd put you in the tub, and when we were there, there were two things, okay? There were two things. She was rough, but a wonderful grandmother. I loved her. But I didn't want to take a bath there. <laughs> because she didn't use baby soap, and that stuff would get in my eyes and make me cry. It hurt. And then she would scrub behind my ears until I felt like the ears were taken off. <laughs> She used to teach me to brush my teeth. Now I go to the dentist and they tell me, would you please quit listening to your grandmother? She's been dead since you were 13. You're brushing too hard. Because everything was hard. Folks, I want Jesus to claim me right. I don't want to have to try to scrub everything to the extent to where I think I'm scrubbing it away. <clears throat> I want him to thoroughly, thoroughly if you want it, but thoroughly get it all the way into every piece of the fabric of my heart and wash me clean. Now I'm thankful that in salvation God has already done this, but we're talking about that everyday relationship that sometimes has an interference in my heart because I've sinned. Folks, God to blot it out as soon as possible. And I want God to, to wash me as deep and as thorough as He can possibly do it. So that it's through every part of me. The next one says, at the end of verse 2, and cleanse me from my sin. That seems like the lightest one, doesn't it? Cleanse me from my sin. We've already asked him to, to blot it out. 
We've already asked him to wash me as <coughs> thorough and as, as through everything as he can. But folks, even after you get dirt loose, you know, one of the things I get convicted of in, in my home, that convicted isn't the spiritual side of things. I'm saying I get in trouble for it. Is I'm washing dishes helping my wife, and I've washed something that has grease in it, and I keep washing other dishes. Okay? When you see the idea of cleanse, it's the idea of truly wash it all the way out. Not just get it free. Not just get it loose. And then wash the rest of the way in the water. No. Once you get it all free and loose, wash it off of me. Fix it completely. Now, please don't misunderstand me. David here is not asking from, or, or for, sorry, for a, a release from any consequences. That's not what he's doing. I'm not telling you you do this and consequences or, or struggles in life won't come because of what you have made as a mistake. David, in, in essence, had four different family members heavily dealt with by God. Okay? Even with this confession. So I'm not trying to tell you when we sin that that means a, an expulsion of all um, uh, you know, the, the problems that come with the failure in the first place. But I am telling you this. It is so much better even in the midst of dealing with those things when we recognize, yes, this is my consequence. But I am because I trusted in the only thing that could clean me. God himself. So, the first thing is, we can only call on God's mercy. It's in verse 1 and 2. He must help according to his loving kindness and according to his tender mercies. He must clean. He must blot out, wash me, and cleanse me. And without that, I will not have the, the true freedom from the regenerate heart that I really want, the true freedom from my sin. The second part is we can only call on God's truth. And this is very interesting to me, and I think this is the theme of this whole first thing, because in verse 1 and 2, you see that he recognizes he must have God. He must have God. There was a time when God laid on David's heart. How dare that giant talk about God that way. Go get him. A little boy. A young teenager. Go get him. And he could go. And you know why he could go? When Saul the king said, but, but you're just a boy. <laughs> Sir, I have beat the lion through the power and strength of God. I have fought the bear because God did it. And God will go before me with his giant. Folks, I'm telling you this because I want you to understand that David had great victories, and yet what did he call on when he's dealing with sin? Not one of them. Not one of them. He called on God. It wasn't, I've been a great man. I've had my failures, but I've done pretty well. It was, Lord, I need you. It was all honesty. We'll get the next part, and I think you'll see this. We can only uh, call on God's truth. Verse 3 says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. I acknowledge my transgressions. Again, remember I told you that the greatest struggle is that even if we admit to our sin, we fail to admit to it to the level that it is between God and I. We make things out to be, say for instance, little white lies rather than their lies. One of the things that absolutely annoys me in our world is the way that people are willing to lie. To what extent they're willing to go to say whatever they want to make, whatever they want the outcome and the end result. 
And I'll just tell you this, it's not just in our world, on our news, and in politics. It's everywhere in the world, even in Christian circles. Folks, copy that. He says, I acknowledge, I acknowledge, I'm coming out, God, to you. I'm being clean. I'm admitting to you 100%. I have faith. You have a pastor, he didn't admit it right away. No, not right away. God had to send Nathan, the prophet, to him and tell him that he stole somebody else's sheep. In a little parable that ends up waking him up. But in the midst of that parable and the correction that comes, David's heart is truly listening to what God is doing because God did care about him and wanted to help. And David turns to God with this prayer. And a part of any time we want our heart to be truly regenerated and fixed needs to begin with, I acknowledge. I admit it. Now I will say a side note here, folks. When people are, are, you know, willing to deal with what's in their heart, their failures, there needs to be a lot more forgiveness from within the body. Because I think sometimes the greatest reason why people won't come out and say, I've, I've failed at this, I've struggled with this, I need help with this, is because they're uh, concerned about the way they'll be judged by everybody else. That's not right. That's not right. Folks, as we deal with things, we acknowledge, we, we get the consequences, but we find God's grace and cleansing and, and freedom. It's mercy. And the end result is a glorious ability to have a great relationship with God. So he can say about us that we are people after his heart. Not because we haven't failed, but because in that failure we have responded the correct way. In truth, I acknowledge that I have done wrong. Again, I'm not telling you public confession that fixes everything. That's not it. There are some things we need to do publicly because they are publicly in front of everyone. But there are other things that are between you and the Lord. And the real key is you must acknowledge to God. One of the hardest things that I deal with as a pastor in trying to counsel people and help people is to get them to admit the depth of their failure. I can't look at their heart. I can't know every single thing. Folks, to admit their mistake. I acknowledge, and by the way, not to me, to God. You can see, you can see in the life of someone who <laughs> recognizes where they are with God. Who finds themselves forgiven, free, blessed, undeserved, but seeing God's hand. So the first thing that I see here is acknowledge my sin. And then he says in this verse also, um, he says, and my sin is ever before me. Now, are we saying here that God wants you to forever keep your sin as a central piece of who you are and then what you're saying is I'm, I'm a terrible person? Well, I hate to tell you this, but in a way, yeah. In, in forgiveness, you're forgiven. And in far as east is from the west, it's supposed to go away. But what was one of the greatest things that kept Paul what he was supposed to be? The willingness to be able to say in his own heart on a consistent basis, I have murdered. But God has cleansed me. I dare you to look through the scripture and see how many times Paul says something to that effect. Because it shaped 
the way that he responded. When he was beaten, when he was stoned, when he was cast off the cliffs, when he was shipwrecked, when anything happened, what did he say? I do not deserve this. Remember what I said at the beginning? This isn't fair. That's not what he said. His response always was, I need to die to me because me isn't very good. I want to live for him and I'll do it with all I've got. You see, I think part of acknowledging is to remember. Not remember in a way where the devil holds you down with his press and says, you're no good as a Christian. Not that remember. But to remember that says, I owe him everything. I deserve nothing. And I owe him everything. That's the remember that's here. And the end result is, again, a greater freedom for the regenerated heart to have that right relationship with Almighty God. And I find great blessing in this. Now I want to tell you that I didn't give you point A or point B or one or two or any of that with this second point here. We can only call on God's truth because I didn't know how to do it. Because if you look at verse 4, I think verse 4 at the beginning tells you acknowledge my sin. And here, here it is. Look, look at verse 4. The beginning of it, it goes with acknowledge my sin. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. So the acknowledgement is, I recognize that against you. Now, by the way, again, did he sin against Israel by staying home and sending out the troops and then committing adultery with one of the people that lived next to the palace? You better believe it. And his wife. And so on and so forth. But his recognition is the real person that he sinned against is Almighty God. You think about Joseph. Joseph is, you know, constantly one bad thing after the other happened in his life. His brother sells him into slavery. He goes down and he works for this man Potiphar as a slave. God ends up promoting him through the ranks and, and is blessing him. And here comes Potiphar's wife offering herself. Joseph's response to her, I think, is massively key in how we're supposed to approach things. How can I do this great thing before God? I can't. I can't. Folks, I want you to understand that David's response is, in his total acknowledgement, the ultimate individual that I have sinned before is not even myself. It's you, God, because you're almighty and you have cleansed me. And I didn't care. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound, Romans 6 tells us? God forbid. You see, David is acknowledging, as verse 3 says, here in the beginning of verse 4, he's acknowledging his sin. My sin was against God Almighty. It's against you. And you've seen every part of this evil. Okay, uh, against thee and the only have I son, sinned and done this evil in thy sight. You've seen it. See, a lot of times we, we think we're in secret. We think nobody else is there. We think no one else sees and we involve a bunch of people in it. Just like David did. But folks, the end result is we sin against God and that's what matters most. And acknowledging that... Do you see what that changes in my response when I finally say, God, I didn't just sin against my wife or against my friends or against... I sinned against you. Do you see what that does? The next part, remember, acknowledge my sin against the only and done evil in thy sight. Now, keep it before me. Here it comes back again at the end of verse 4. Okay, it says... And in sin, wait, no, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong verse. Uh, verse 4. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Um, by the way, <laughs> does David have any ability to justify God? No. Does God need any help from David to make him clear? No. But folks, 
key, key to this acknowledging our sin is that it, it, it is keeping it before me, this mentality of when I go to receive the punishment, the judgment, the whatever that I deserve, my attitude is one of what? You're justified in everything you say. You are truly clear in what your judgment is. Remember I told you that one of the greatest things that's missing in Christian circles from Psalm 50, one of the greatest things missing in Christian circles is a willingness to admit reality. I told you that many people in conservative circles, they, they don't like... Um, Toby Mac. I know I keep mentioning this. But how many of you went home and listened to that psalm? Psalm 21. Did any of you listen to it? Did that break your heart or what? The honesty. I don't know if you, if you know about his son, but he was struggling to make right decisions. And the father writes a song... About his prodigal son. Going home. The honesty is amazing. It's breathtaking. Did Toby asked about his son. Did you run into his arms? Honesty. In my own heart. I love when I do funerals. It's always <laughs> the person was the most wonderful person ever. They're in a much better place. You know, those type of things. And I don't know if you know this, but when I preach funerals, I try not to give everything as roses and flowers. <coughs> I try to be honest. If the person had bumps, I try to be honest about their bumps. Because the end result is then we're giving God the right glory, what He truly deserves. That He saved a sinner who needed help. And he was a help to this individual on a regular basis. I'm telling you, we, 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 we need to be honest. Toby Mac's song is telling the world, God needed to take my son home because he wasn't listening to God. I wanted him longer. Couldn't I have one more day? But the prodigal has gone home. Pure, brutal honesty. Hello. You see, when I'm honest that way in my own heart, I acknowledge to God, not just that I've sinned and it was before you, but God, I'll never forget it. So when things come my way, I can be like the Apostle Paul, and I can say, I've been forgiven so much, it's no big deal. Shipwrecked, bitten by a snake, thrown off a cliff, no big deal. Because compared to what I've been given, for what I don't deserve, and what I've actually done, There's something amazing in that idea of, I am admitting to this completely, God, so that for all others it is clear that you are justified. You do understand that that actual recognition is you are justified in killing the first child from Bathsheba. 
you are justified in allowing my son to do something terrible to my daughter. You are justified in allowing these things in my family. Tell him, folks. It's pretty hefty. It's why David, when the child dies, the Bible tells us that he's there and he's mourning and he's crying and he's begging God to change the, the outcome of whether this child's going to die. And he won't eat and he won't anything. And the moment the child dies, he gets up. And he's ready to eat, he's ready to get clean, he's ready to go. And everybody's like, what is that? And his response was, the child can't come to me. But someday, I'll go to the child. Do you know what that is? True recognition. It was not, God, you're being unfair. God, you are doing me wrong. And I'm going to tell you, we, family, Christian people, we do that an awful lot to God. And he's not unfair. <coughs> he's not unjust. Things need to be acknowledged in our heart. So that his judgment is true and clear. So that we get a real picture of where we are. Well, again, I'm not trying to get you to go out of here and say, man, I'm in a terrible spot with God. That's not the purpose. The purpose is realize you can regenerate your heart. It's by actually coming to God and say, I bear it open. And I admit to every bit of it. Clean. Fix me. That's awesome. Listen, let's look at verse 5. Verse 5 is not an excuse. Let me remind you that. Not an excuse. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. It is an actual admission that I recognize I am a failure. I am living up to what failures are. Remember, as a saved, regenerate person, I'm not supposed to be doing these things. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm supposed to walk in the newness of life, Romans 6 again tells us. I'm not supposed to be dwelling in the past and living out more sin. I'm dead to the flesh. I'm dead to sin. And yet, what do I do? Still allow it. Still participate. Folks, what I need to realize is not an excuse, but a true understanding. Again, can I fix it on my own? No. Can I do anything about this failure and this struggle without God's help? I predetermined. There are some out there that tell you, make up your mind that the next time this sin comes your way, you're not going to let it in. <sighs> Folks, what you need to do is you need to tell God, without you, I'm going to do it again. I need you. I want you to fix me. Cleanse me. I need your tender mercies because this has got a hold on me. And I want to stop Now, I'm not just talking about big, nasty sins. You know, the ones that everybody calls the big nasties. I'm talking about the way you might snap at somebody. And, and you hate yourself afterwards. When you go back to your room, you're saying, to yourself, man, I should not have talked to them like that. I'm talking about those. I'm talking about the way we respond in a grocery store when somebody cuts us off. Folks, we need to be more aware and let God do some mighty things in us because of it. So that we're admitted to Him. I need you help. 
This is a struggle area. Man, when I am driving, by the way, I can lend you a child if you'd like to ride around a little bit and see whether you're driving and you're talking to yourself and saying things about drivers. Because the best way to learn that you're doing those things is to have a kid that's telling you exactly what you say or... We have so many areas that we can fix. Maybe what God wants us to do is decide it's time to just give it to Him and be honest. We struggle with this and we need His help. Because we can't do it. That's what He's doing, verse 5. And then verse 6 is our theme for today. And we're going to look at this in closing. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. What God really wants from me is He wants me to come to the place where I am truth. The truth that acknowledges that I have sinned and I have failed and this sin and failure is against God. That acknowledges that I'm going to keep that sin in my mind so that I recognize that the struggles that I am going through are a result. Or at least in some extended way, deserved, not undeserved. Because anyone who has sinned, anyone who has sinned does not deserve all the good things we like. And thus change your attitude when you're going through things that this isn't God's punishment or curse. Maybe it is and you need to fix that, but it isn't God's punishment or curse. Instead, it is God working in your life. And He is still there. And we must come to the place where we see Him as the only form of help based on His mercy and loving kindness and His tenderness and that mercy. He says here in the... Truth in the inward parts. A, a real recognition. I told you before, I wouldn't make a very good lawyer. I've been to jails and visited people and tried to help people, some from the neighborhood and some from within our church. And I wouldn't make a very good lawyer. Because I have a couple questions. Did you do it? Then don't tell anybody else I anything else but me. I did it. I plead for mercy. I made a mistake. Don't make excuses. Don't make up some story. Don't get off on some technicality. You tell the truth. I did it. And the end result is we start the healing immediately. Because then as you sit there in jail, you're not saying to yourself, I don't deserve to be here or they were too mean to me or I did No, you say to yourself, Anything that God's doing for me. I'm so glad I'm free spiritually. <coughs> Praise the Lord. So he says, And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. In other words, he even understands that down deep inside of him, where, remember in the New Testament, we're told that we need to ask God to try the range because we don't even know our own thoughts and intent sometimes. Okay? And we're asking God, fix those internal things. Know me so deeply and so perfectly that you not only wash me thoroughly and, and do all these things, but, but I want you, God, to be someone who is truly working on the hidden parts way down deep inside. <coughs> Teach me your wisdom. The ultimate proof that David got of what was really wrong in his sin. I need your truth. I want it to be clear why you did what you did. Why you've judged me the way you have. <coughs> in my own heart, I come to the place where I'm where your truth is dwelling in those innermost parts. Folks, that's step one in having a truly regenerated heart. One where the devil can't hold you back from serving God completely. Where he can't prevent you from seeing yourself as a loved, washed and bought and paid for by God 
believer whom God can use whatever your failures. <clears throat> there might be certain things you can't do. David was not permitted to build a temple. But God said, can't let you build a temple because you're a man of love, but you've done it. But I'll count it as if you build it. Folks, huge, huge way God does things. Let's turn them all over to him. Let's not leave here today with something strange in our heart. With us telling God he's not been fair, he's not giving me what I want. Just give it to him. Let's be brutally honest with our own selves. And turn it over to God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around. For just a moment, I'd like to talk to you. I'm not going to reiterate the whole message. I want to ask you first of all. If you die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? You know that He loves you. And He wants to extend those tender mercies and kindness to you. Will you accept Him? If you're here today and say, Pastor Andrew, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven if I died today. Because I don't know about that relationship with God. Right we are, just raise your hand.
superficial, but you restore us from the inside out. And that it is nothing but your hand. It is all you, and you free us from ourselves. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming.